Welcome to the NIOSH Director's Webinar Series. This series examines topics related to work and fatigue. Today's webinar focuses on fatigue mitigation and emergency medical services. I'm Dr. Imelda Wong, and it is my pleasure to serve as a moderator for today's webinar. On behalf of the NIOSH Center for Work and Fatigue Research, we are pleased to have you join us today with our featured speaker, Dr. Mr. Patterson is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and James Page Professor of Emergency Healthcare Worker Safety. He is also a nationally registered paramedic and a fellow of the Academy of Emergency Medical Services. He studies safety in emergency care settings with special emphasis on safety fatigue, safety culture, shift work, sleep health, teamwork, medical errors, and adverse events, and clinical injury in the pre-hospital EMS setting. Collaborations have led to creation of reliable and valid safety measurement tools and establishing base rate data for key indicators of EMS safety. He has led multidisciplinary teams in evidence reviews and experimental studies testing novel interventions to improve safety. His research is informed by the immersion in EMS setting as a paramedic clinician. For more information about this presentation, please visit the NIOSH Work Schedules webpage. And thank you for your participation today, and now I'll turn it over to our featured speaker, Dr. Patterson. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present today. And thank you to NIOSH and um, everyone who's involved in organizing the presentation. Today, I want to just overview, provide an overview of some fatigue mitigation strategies that we have worked on for a number of years now, focused on emergency medical services. Talk specifically about the evidence and how we've synthesized that evidence into recommendations. And then also talk a little bit about a focus on worker health. Uh, my disclosures uh, are presented there in front of you. I work for the University of Pittsburgh, also as a paramedic, and have funding from a number of federal and foundation sources. So, I'm imagining that many on the call today or on the webinar uh, don't have a deep, too deep of an understanding of emergency medical services and its history here in the United States. So many of us in EMS look back to the evolution of modern EMS as being marked by the 1966 white paper titled Accidental Death and Disability, The Neglected Disease in Modern Society. And that really started a conversation about the gross inadequacies of emergency response to acute illness and injury, mainly on the nation's highways uh, in the 1960s. And what that also revealed through subsequent uh, assessments was that approximately half of all emergency care for the acutely ill and injured were delivered by uh, morticians and that seems a little bit like a conflict of interest. Hence the design of the early ambulances, much like the uh, hearses. Well, in the 1970s, a number of laws were passed that provided uh, millions of dollars to support education and training and also a number of demonstration projects that would lead to what we now see today as more modern emergency medical services with specifically trained paramedics and EMTs and other types of EMS clinicians. And I'm very proud to be sitting in Pittsburgh, which is uh, home to one of the nation's most well-recognized demonstration projects, the Freedom House Ambulance Corps, uh, which we see here as a core beginning to EMS locally. Now, one of our most recent assessments of EMS nationally was led by the National Association of State EMS Officials, and the total number of EMS organizations uh, totals around 20,000, including air and ground services, and there are approximately 1 million EMS clinicians of diverse certification levels out there. In terms of workload or volume, uh, our best estimates right now have us at around 28 plus million transports annually. And if you look at the hospital transport data, the emergency department data, uh, 
EMS represents approximately 15% of all emergency department volume, and that equates to around 35 to 38 patient transports every minute of every day. And as I mentioned a moment ago, there are numerous different levels of certification for an emergency medicine uh, pre-hospital clinician. We have emergency medical responders, EMT basics, uh, intermediates or advanced EMTs, paramedics, who can also be trained in advanced procedures and medication delivery, uh, who become critical care paramedics or flight paramedics. We have pre-hospital flight nurses and spe specially trained emergency physicians. And there are numerous different types of EMS agencies out there. I work in what could be classified as a fire-based or fire EMS merged EMS operation. Um, and that means that part of our operations involves fire response and the other part involves emergency medical services response. Uh, the ownership and the financing of EMS operations varies dramatically from location to location, even sometimes within the same county. Uh, here in Allegheny County, which is where Pittsburgh is, we have more than 40 different EMS operations within the county, and they all differ uh, in terms of their uh, ownership and financing slightly. Uh, there are very geographic responsibilities for EMS operations. Many have county borders as their defined geography. Others have townships or boroughs. Others have other response areas that can overlap uh, different types of geographic and political boundaries. While we have differences in EMS structurally, uh, uh, paramedics and EMTs for the, for the most part, follows similar protocols in terms of their clinical care nationally. And this illustration is, is by no means a 100% accurate portrayal of the diversity and types across the nation. However, it gives you some sense of what is out there. In the Northeast, we see a lot of smaller sized EMS operations that cover townships or boroughs. And then in the south, we see more county-based EMS operations that are defined by their county borders and are typically referred to as third service models, which means they are in the triad of public safety, fire, police, and then EMS. As you start to move west, if you go into the upper Midwest region like Minnesota, you can see more hospital-based EMS operations like Alina or the the former Gold Cross, now Mayo Clinic EMS operation. As you start to get into more rural areas, you see a, a high prevalence of volunteer type EMS operations. And then as you get further west, you see more merged fire EMS type uh, models. And then the type of work that EMS clinicians perform is, is pretty straightforward. You know, the, the whole goal here is to really stabilize the acutely ill or injured uh, patient, whether it be from a medical reason or a trauma, traumatic reason. Uh, the workload is really unscheduled. It is really unpredictable. Um, I work typically one shift a week, and my volume can range from one call over a 16-hour shift to 10 over a given shift, and you really don't know what the volume is going to look like from shift to shift. As a result of responding to medical and traumatic emergencies, um, these workers, paramedics and EMTs and, and flight nurses and flight paramedics, are exposed to a lot of emotional distress, a lot of emotionally charged traumatic events. Um, they can perform really invasive procedures such as, such as trying to maintain your airway by sticking an endotracheal tube down the throat to help you continue breathing or to establish breathing. Um, as a result of the use of these invasive procedures, medications, and being surrounded by um, some emotionally charged bystanders in many cases, the job can become very, very stressful. Um, however, you wouldn't really know it uh, based off of a lot of the prevalence data that has been published in the peer-reviewed literature. 
that data would suggest that the prevalence of acute stress or chronic stress for the most part is is fairly low or at least lower than you might expect and that may be a result of the type of worker that chooses a life of EMS they may be more resilient uh, to those sorts of stressors than the average um, shift worker in terms of the type of work and their pay uh, some data recently reported in the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that the median hourly wage is around $17 an hour. That means half of all EMS personnel make less than that. And that would lead to one of the reasons why approximately 35 to 45% work multiple jobs. And I can tell you that uh, within the area that I work, that for the most part, probably a good 60% of EMS clinicians where I work in the area of the Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania region, around probably 60% will have multiple jobs. It can be as high as 80% in some locations if you look at the published data. Many in EMS will work excessive overtime, uh, given the low uh, wages that are prevalent among a lot of EMS operations. And many will work long duration shifts or back-to-back -back shifts or uh, consecutive shifts. Now, I, what, what the purpose of today's talk, or one of the focus areas, is fatigue. And I do have a few videos, and we hope that they play okay. And one of the things I want to show you is what has been reported in the news media with respect to some of the problems related to fatigue. So we're going to try to play a video here. Hopefully it will be uh, smooth. If not, then we'll just, we'll just move on. Just this week alone in Maine, two ambulance drivers nodded off while driving. The first one was Wednesday in Masardis. The ambulance rolled over and took out a utility pole. It's an industry where sleep is hard to come by. Palmer says depending on the day, she gets some rest. So we've learned that the ambulance was just feet away from its destination to Kaiser Permanente when that EMT says he fell asleep at the wheel, missed this curb here, jumped it, hit that sign, and flipped over. It could have been so much worse. They found that a second camera recorded what was going on inside okay, the cab. What we came to find out is that uh, so we'll just we'll just move on to that. This driver is on the 24th hour of a 24-hour shift straight without any breaks. Yeah. So the Puckett ambulance the driver involved in last really week's fatal accident turned herself into authorities at the Floyd really County Jail. Can, um, be identified in the news media on a regular basis, and it. Uh, it is quite alarming once you do see some of these reports. It can be um, quite scary to know that um, many of your first responders are susceptible to uh, sleep deprivation and as a result have uh, some negative consequences such as um, a, a ambulance crash where either the clinicians become injured or die or the patients. And that does happen from time to time. Now, with respect to prevalence estimates of fatigue, it really depends on which study you pick up. The estimates vary from study to study, and that obviously is a result of the target population who have been sampled and other factors. But we have, on a regular basis, surveyed EMS clinicians in different geographic areas of the U.S., and pretty consistently we will identify greater than half of EMS personnel reporting uh, mental and physical fatigue while at work. Now, we know from the uh, professional organizations such as the National Sleep Foundation and other organizations that we need generally seven to nine hours of sleep. And we know from some of the nationwide assessments such as the National Health Interview Survey that many adults in the U.S. will report approximately seven hours of sleep per night. However, many report poor sleep, around 30% or so, depending on which uh, data you look at. Now, for EMS, um, and Evan, we don't have to go to that video. We'll just, we'll just bypass that, given that the interruption from the last one. Um, in EMS, Many of the individuals will report regularly getting less than six hours of sleep, 
between four and six hours of sleep is most commonly reported in the area that, that I uh, am located and also with a lot of the individuals who we assess on uh, the nationwide level. And our data has shown that a pro a less than um, about approximately half of EMS personnel will report less than six hours of sleep per night. And greater than half of those who we have assessed on a regular basis will report poor sleep quality as measured by the uh, PSQI, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, a common measure of, of sleep quality. Now, I, I want to highlight here for you some of the sleep data from EMS workers to kind of paint a picture for you that while we have broad prevalence estimates of inadequate sleep, the sleep patterns of EMS personnel really vary dramatically. And the top strip here, which is these are all actigraph strips, um, shows you the data, the top one there, shows you data from an EMS worker who was working a 24-hour shift. And what you can see there, if you know anything about actigraph data, the little blue lines and yellow lines show activity, whereas those red marks that you see in the second and third line below indicate uh, sleep. And But what you see in that top row is that there is no sleep. And this is very common for individuals who work at busier EMS operations um, where patient loads can be quite uh, significant. Uh, they don't really have time to sleep on duty, or in some cases don't have the permission to sleep on duty. So you can see from this one individual who was a young EMT in his early 20s, uh, during this episode when we were monitoring him, he didn't get any sleep during his 24-hour shift. Now, if you look at the middle section there, this is an individual who also worked a 24-hour shift. However, what you see here is this individual was able to get sleep on two different occasions during that 24-hour period, and they were able to obtain substantial amounts of sleep during the shift. And this can happen uh, depending on their workload and um, what opportunities they may have available for intra-shift sleep. The bottom row uh, actigraph strip shows an individual who was working an eight-hour overnight shift from 11 p.m. to um, approximately 7 a.m. And what you see here is that this individual was able to obtain a short nap prior to their shift and also a brief nap during the middle of their shift, during the early morning hours. Now, what I want to point out here is that while these data come from three different EMS workers, this data could very easily come from one EMS worker. And we do have longitudinal studies underway where we are monitoring EMS workers for, for example, seven days in a row or two weeks in a row. And we see this type of pattern with individuals, not, not also just between individuals, where their patterns and their sleep opportunities vary dramatically. Um, I'm going to skip this slide, but in terms of fatigue, if you ask an individual EMS worker about fatigue, they will pretty readily and pretty quickly tell you that, yeah, fatigue is a problem in EMS and that it's, it is something that needs to be addressed um, with um, action both from the employers and also they will admit that they need to do a better job as well. So it is a, it is a issue that EMS workers do recognize is problematic. Now, years ago, um, you may have gotten a different answer where if, if an individual in, in EMS may have admitted to fatigue, they may have also perceived that you were identifying some sort of inadequacy in their ability to perform while sleep deprived. But more recently, uh, as the younger uh, generation enters the workforce, uh, you, you see more individuals willing to actually admit that fatigue is, is a problem. Now, while fatigue is a problem, we have to also recognize, uh, and this is the conversation that usually um, unfolds when you talk to an EMS administrator, you're not going to get rid of shift work. We, we're going to have shift work. It's going to be around, and we're going to have to really just adapt to it in the best way that we can. So what, what do we need to do? And what can we do as um, in our positions? Well, what I want to highlight is that 
there is a tremendous amount of research out there that highlights sleep uh, deprivation or inadequate sleep and fatigue among shift workers as a problem. A tremendous amount of research. And prior to 2018, when we published the guidelines that I'm about to describe for you, um, fatigue, again, was, was acknowledged as a threat, but there wasn't really much that EMS workers or administrators could do because it was simply thought of as woven into the fabric of what EMS operations is all about. You, you're going to get fatigued. It's just part of the job. However, um, with some support from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and some collaboration with the National Association of State, State EMS Officials, we were able to examine the evidence and to provide some tailored guidance to EMS employers to help them make good decisions about developing um, fatigue risk management programs. Prior to this, there was really no guidance for them to follow that had been tailored to the unique aspects of EMS. Here is uh, an illustration of the logo, the website, the funding number uh, for the evidence-based guideline project. It is a three-phased project. Phase one uh, dealt with examining the evidence and developing tailored recommendations for EMS. Phase two is actually currently underway, as is phase three. Phase two, we are actually uh, testing one of the recommendations in an experimental study. And phase three involves um, developing or calibrating an existing biomathematical model to be sensitive to the unique scheduling needs of EMS. And uh, the National Association of State EMS Officials is the lead um, organization helping with managing phase two and three. And I'm leading the uh, experimental study along with the National Association of State EMS Officials. Now, what are evidence-based guidelines. Well, for those of you in medicine, you most often will link EDGs, evidence-based guidelines, with clinical decision-making because there are very few applications of evidence-based guidelines for operational issues like fatigue risk management. Um, so when we talk about EDGs, a lot of the EMS workers uh, are very familiar with that term because over the past 10 years, there has been a, a tr dramatic increase in clinically focused EBGs with respect to how EMS clinicians care for the acutely ill and injured. I think with respect to our project, it could be labeled an operational EBG, uh, evidence-based guideline, which is fairly new, as I just mentioned. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the details of the project, because that could take up the entire presentation, and we do have a few other things to talk about. Uh, but I will cover a few of the high points. And if you know anything about evidence-based guideline development, um, core to that process is, includes multiple systematic reviews of different focused research questions um, that will be eventually translated into or synthesized by expert panels and maybe if there's if the evidence is substantial enough based off of the opinion of the expert panel could be turned into recommendations and so for the purposes of our um, uh, EBG project we had a group of experts who came up with seven focused research questions and we, in total, reviewed uh, over 38,000 pieces of literature. And you can see the differences in, you know, across the different research questions. And I'm going to cover what we found uh, for each of these uh, research questions. Now, what I have to mention in advance of going through these is that for the question number six and question number seven, the evidence was not substantial enough uh, so that the expert panel felt confident enough in developing a recommendation. And I will cover that at the end here in more detail. Now, with respect to the recommendations that resulted from this whole process, the first one, uh, pretty straightforward, is the promotion of EMS employers to use reliable and or valid 
fatigue or sleeping as survey instruments to measure or monitor fatigue. In the past, many in EMS operations would simply go to Google, type in fatigue survey, and probably just pull down whatever was freely available in a PDF format or a Word format and try to somehow apply that to their their operation, even if they were willing to do that. Many were not even willing to do that. So um, what we have done with the first systematic review is to go through and identify um, um, the literature where reliability and validity of an instrument, a fatigue or sleepiness instrument, was tested with a shift worker population and to summarize that in the systematic review. With respect to recommendation two, we looked at differences in shift duration and how that was associated with different outcomes, such as safety outcomes and uh, performance outcomes. And what the panel uh, came up with in terms of their recommendation was that EMS personnel should work shifts shorter than 24 hours in duration. With respect to the third systematic review and the recommendation that resulted, uh, the panel came up with a recommendation that says EMS personnel should have access to caffeine as a fatigue countermeasure. It seems pretty straightforward, but as I'm going to explain here shortly, it's not that straightforward in terms of um, uh, cost or feasibility in some places. The fourth recommendation that resulted from the, the deliberations of the evidence was that EMS personnel should have the opportunity and permission to nap while on duty. That too is a little bit of a controversial recommendation which I will talk about more here shortly. And the fifth recommendation was that based off of the evidence, EMS personnel should receive education and training in sleep health and fatigue mitigation as a part of their onboarding or new hire process and periodically every couple of years to receive updates, much like a continuing education program. These are the five recommendations that resulted from that EBG process. And if you want to know more about the details of this, I definitely have some links for you towards the end here that um, could point you in uh, the direction of more detail. But let me discuss a little bit more about each of these. So with respect to the use of reliable and valid instruments, we had a companion uh, publication that outlined how EMS workers, I'm sorry, employers, could apply this to a fatigue risk management program. And then one of the uh, components of that was to offer a performance goal that work uh, employers could follow or try to adhere to. And what we came up with was that EMS employers should make their best effort to assess fatigue or sleepiness um, at least once a quarter using one of the tools or uh, a tool that has some reliability and validity associated with it. Now, we identified a number of tools that had been previously examined with shift workers and that also reported some reliability and or validity data. And what's unique about this is that um, many in EMS are not familiar with the diversity and tools that are out there and available. And you have to really um, preface what you talk about in terms of assessing fatigue and sleepiness with questions related to how do you want to go about measuring fatigue or sleepiness? Do you want to assess fatigue in, with respect to how individuals feel right now at this moment, how they felt or, or perceived their fatigue level in the previous shift, uh, previous week, month, et cetera? So, you know, when I am asked about how, from EMS employers, how to go about assessing fatigue, usually it's a more detailed conversation rather than just simply pointing out one or two types of instruments. It involves asking them to clarify what are your goals here, how do you want your program to be developed in terms of um, what types of uh, uh, assessments do you want to do. Do you want to do it in terms of how they feel right now versus past week, past shift, etc. Now with respect to shift duration, as I mentioned before, the evidence uh, synthesized by the expert panel did point to a recommendation that uh, EMS workers should work shifts shorter than 24 hours. And the performance goal that was set in the companion document was that 100% of all shifts should be less than 24 hours in duration. Now, we all know in EMS that this is simply not feasible in some operations. The reality is 
that in some EMS operations, it is not going to be feasible to limit uh, shift durations to less than 24 hours due to cost or manpower or other reasons. And then what is promoted as a result of, of, of that reality is a tailored recommendation that says where feasible, if you are unable to limit shift durations to less than 24 hours, where feasible, try to adopt other recommendations to have a robust fatigue risk management program. In terms of access to caffeine, um, EMS personnel, the recommendation should have access to caffeine as a fatigue countermeasure. They shouldn't be required to consume caffeine, obviously, but they should have access to it. And the performance goal here was that 100% of shifts should have access to caffeine. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that seems to be logical, or at least um, pretty uh, straightforward. However, it is not that straightforward. I have in the past worked for EMS operations where you are, and many operations use this kind of model, you are deployed in the ambulance the entire shift. You are required to sit in the ambulance the entire shift and post or be located in different areas of the geography to which the EMS agency is responsible for. In many cases, you are posting or located in an area where there is no access to a convenience store or other um, resource that could provide uh, caffeine for purchase. You are on rural roads in many cases, and therefore your access is quite limited. Um, there's also the burden of cost. One of the uh, larger EMS operations located in western Pennsylvania, um, prior to the publication of these recommendations, actually um, eliminated their, their coffee provision for the organization because it was a substantial cost. It was $30,000 or more per year for them to provide uh, coffee to their crew members. As a result of this publication, they actually reinstituted the coffee. And every time I visit a representative from this agency, uh, the clinicians will remind me of, of that, positive, <laughs> that positive impact from that uh, recommendation. In terms of the napping recommendation, uh, again, this is another controversial recommendation that EMS personnel should have the opportunity and permission to nap while on duty. The performance goal that was set is that there should be permission and opportunity on 100% of extended shifts and especially on shifts that take place during the overnight hours. Now, there, this is controversial for a number of reasons. And there are, I'm going to just highlight a couple of these reasons. And there's a YouTube link here that takes you to a video that shows you, that shows um, a news report of some uh, citizen who just happened to walk up on a crew while being posted in the ambulance. They had happened to doze off uh, while sitting in the front of the ambulance, as you see here in this picture, just like that. Uh, that in, that video footage was then sent to the news media, and it just it, it went through the news media like crazy. And so we have there's a negative public perception of EMS personnel sleeping while being on the job. Um, it seems to violate this principle of readiness that EMS personnel should be ready at any time, and therefore be good stewards of the community because in many cases. Uh, community tax dollars support at least some aspect of EMS operation readiness. And there's also a cost to this. You know, our, our crew members, uh, our employers going to be responsible for funding uh, cots or beds or other resources that need to be in place if you have um, uh, a, a policy in place that allows them to sleep on duty. Another aspect of this, which is very visible to EMS operations, is sleep inertia. Now, there are some uh, benchmarks out there for performance that EMS personnel try their hardest to be out of the station or to be having what they call wheels rolling within a minute or two of being dispatched. And as you can, as you can quite imagine that the public does expect that once they call 911, that a paramedic show up on the door within a couple minutes. That is the expectation. And in order to meet that expectation, you have to have a very short time interval from dispatch to actually responding on the road with the crew. 
Um, now, if we if we do have a NAP in place, you can for those of you who are on the on the webinar know uh, about sleep inertia, and many of you do that this can be a problem because it take it can take a few minutes or more, and 15 minutes to 30 minutes or more in some cases uh, to overcome that sleep inertia, and also if we have folks in the EMS operations who are facing a substantial amount of sleep deprivation prior to the nap, it may take them even longer to get over uh, a brief nap or even a longer nap while on duty. So uh, this is quite controversial uh, for EMS uh, in terms of um, uh, arguments against napping on duty. The other recommendation that came from that pro, uh, EBG process was that EMS personnel should receive education and training while um, uh, going to the new hire process and also every couple years. That every couple years is very similar to a lot of the other education that EMS personnel go through in terms of renewal of certain types of education and training. So uh, that was the performance goal set by the, the expert panel. In terms of what should be uh, presented in the, in the education and training materials. That is up for debate. However, I do point to some work by Dr. Steve Lerman, uh, a notable uh, occupational uh, physician, med uh, medicine physician, who published a, a seminal paper that outlines a, a number of components that should be included in some education and training. And I would also like to mention that we as a, uh, are in the middle of testing an education program that is modeled after the components that uh, Dr. Lerman outlined in his prior publication. This is a nationwide trial that is underway now. Uh, we obviously have hit the pause button uh, somewhat because of the, um, the recent pandemic, but we do have a program that is uh, 10 modules in, in, um, uh, comprised of 10 modules that addresses numerous aspects of, of sleep health and fatigue education and training. And I'm just going to slide through that. Okay. So what is the goal of the education here? It is really, and I apologize for some of the uh, illustrations not looking correct there, it is really to highlight for the EMS worker the negative impact of sleep deprivation or lack of sleep on their performance, on their safety, but also on their health. And there's a, a large body of research out there that we lean on to make these arguments in the education materials that we have put together for our uh, research projects, but also I think should be emphasized for any research or any intervention materials that are developed uh, targeting EMS personnel. Now, I'm, I'm coming to the end of the discussion about the guidelines, and I want to point out some links to some resources. We did publish a number of papers that highlight the findings from all of the systematic reviews that highlight the evolution of the EBG process from the beginning of the, of the question formulation to the very end. And we've also published a guidebook that is freely available uh, for EMS employers because, again, the, per, the target audience for this EBG project was the EMS employer. You can access these publications free. They are available online. Uh, you can also visit the main uh, project website, emsfatigue.org, to gain access to all of the materials, including presentations that were uh, presented during the entire process. Um, and you can also see who was involved in terms of the expert panel, the investigators, uh, who were all involved in this process. A great resource. Uh, and again, the, the EBGs, the evidence-based guidelines, were published in the Journal of Pre-Hospital Emergency Care uh, March of 2018. Why is this significant? I, I, think this is, I think this is very significant because from when you, when you go about doing an evidence-based guideline project, you the burden, the initial burden, is to identify anything similar that had been done previously so that you don't do too much duplication and that you essentially build on what has done, been done before. We found no prior EBG project related to fatigue mitigation, especially for public safety workers. 
And so I think this is quite significant because we did not find a resource like this previously. This is a model, I think, for all safety-sensitive operations out there to build upon because we didn't isolate our included research only on EMS personnel. We included all types of indirect evidence from all types of shift workers, which included aviation, shipping, rail, transportation of all types. If the publication included data from any type of shift worker, that publication was considered for inclusion in our systematic reviews. So the data itself does not come exclusively from public safety or EMS personnel. It comes from all types of shift workers. So I do think that these systematic reviews and that this uh, process um, can be informative for other types of safety sensitive operations. Other strategies that I want to talk about briefly here. Um, the EBG project, again, was focused primarily on targeting the decision making of um, EMS employers. That was the primary target audience for that project. We can't ignore that the EMS workers themselves can also use information to help make decisions that can improve their personal sleep health and to reduce their fatigue. So I'm going to talk briefly here about a few things that I think would be helpful uh, or that are being helpful for the EMS worker uh, individually. And some of this work has been published. Other work is in process. And I, I, I'll highlight what I'm, what I'm getting at here shortly. So first, I think it's pretty logical. We need to really emphasize more and more to our EMS workers that they just need to get more sleep. As I mentioned before, uh, fatigue and lack of sleep in, in um, just years ago, a decade ago or so, in EMS was considered a badge of honor. Now it is, uh, the issue is being debated more and more visibly as partly resulting from the EBG project published in 2018, but also I think people are more cognizant of their health and safety. And the recommendation that EMS workers get more sleep is not falling on as many deaf ears as, as it used to be. So that's the first step that we need to really emphasize getting more sleep. Uh, the other thing that we can do is to highlight different types of strategies that would allow them to get more sleep. And we just completed recently a an, an, uh, systematic review of the evidence related to this, this strategy referred to as banking or extending sleep. Now, there wasn't a tremendous amount of research out there published uh, uh, examining this particular strategy, but there was enough that we found that it was positive. It had some positive impacts on self-reported sleepiness and fatigue, and also a positive impact on, on sleep latency. And the way that we're approaching this is that we are recommending to EMS workers that if they have the capability to extend their main sleep period prior to a series of shifts, or even in between their shifts, we want them to think of it as banking their sleep. And that would allow them to become, that would allow them to go into those shifts a little bit more well rested and more resilient to the effects of sleep deprivation should they encounter a shift where they are not uh, permitted to sleep or get rest uh, during the shift. Napping. As I mentioned to you previously, napping is quite controversial in EMS. There are EMS organizations that, that promote it, that allow you to nap with some limitations and restrictions written into policy. The vast majority, I would argue, in EMS um, allow you to nap, but they look the other way. It is actually not written into some sort of formal policy or practice uh, because maybe the administrator uh, doesn't feel confident enough to write a policy and go up against um, a council member who they have to be um, um, uh, 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 responsible to for different types of logistical or operational issues in the organization and be able to defend it. So maybe they just look the other way, and that is very common in EMS. And in other EMS operations, there are strict policies against it. 
and I actually have worked in an EMS system in my, in my past where it was a strict policy that if you got caught sleeping on duty, you were fired, and people were actually fired as a result of being caught sleeping on duty. So this is a very controversial thing. It is not widespread across uh, EMS operations across the country. There are certain places that prohibit it, um, and it is, it is a very tense situation um, in terms of crew members feeling comfortable enough to actually take rest or sleep uh, during their shift. And one way to approach this is we, we've done the evidence review, at least from 1980, the publications from 1980 up to 2017, that examines the impact of napping on duty, particularly night shifts, uh, and its impact on performance outcomes or self-reported sleepiness and fatigue. We published that review. That's part of the EBG uh, systematic review uh, uh, project. What we really haven't done a great job of is we haven't done a really good job of looking at the impacts of intra-shift napping on health outcomes. And one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in and focused on is the impact that intra-shift napping may have on particular cardiovascular indicators of cardiovascular health and outcomes. Because we know from some previous research that shift workers do suffer from a higher incidence of hypertension and uh, cardiovascular mortality. So if we can highlight some of those aspects for the individual worker, they, and also for the employer, there may be a turn in their opinion on napping during duty. And I, what I'm going to highlight for you here over the next few slides is one element that I'm focused on that I find particularly interesting. EMS clinicians are very familiar with blood pressure. They know what is considered abnormal blood pressure and what is considered normal blood pressure. Very familiar with that. Now, what I have done is highlighted for them some literature from diverse populations that shows that if you deprive yourself of sleep, you do alter the normal variation in your blood pressure. In particular, you may experience what is called blunting of your dip, your, your nighttime or sleep-related dip in your blood pressure. And that has gotten their attention, at least the, in the circles that I have uh, worked with in terms of collecting some of this data. So this is where I'm going to focus my attention on in terms of trying to highlight some of the health-related uh, impacts of shift work and sleep deprivation for EMS workers. And one way that I actually approach this discussion is I say, imagine this. Imagine that you have gone through your three night shifts in a row for a given week, and that is a particularly a common shift pattern for EMS where they do three twelves, three nights, in a row or three days in a row, if you're on day turn. But if they're doing three nights in a row, imagine that they have a series of blunted periods of their blood pressure being blunted over um, a, a series of shifts. And imagine repeating this pattern for 10 or 20 years. What could happen to you in terms of your cardiovascular health down the line? Now, we don't have a tremendous amount of data, longitudinal data, that would link uh, blunting now related to your shift work and your cardiovascular outcomes later in life, but we do have a few studies that we can highlight. Here's one that looked at blunting at the present day uh, and then 15, 10 to 15 years later. And what they found was that if you were blunted in terms of your sleep-related dip uh, in present day, uh, or you had overdipping, and there is a thing called overdipping. Um, your odds of, of, of coronary artery calcium, which is an indicator of cardiovascular disease, 10 to 15 years later was much higher than those who did not experience the blunted dipping or the overdipping. So we highlight some literature like that, and that really gets their attention. And here's some data that I want to show uh, from our recent study of 56. Uh, EMS workers who work night shifts, and they work a variety of different night shifts. This is data from an EMT who had worked a 24-hour shift without any sleep. And you can see the top line here, which is their systolic blood pressure, and this bottom line here is their diastolic. While they were working that 24-hour shift, you can see that their blood pressure was blunted. However, when they were able to recover uh, on their day off, you can see that it actually did dip 
to that 10 to 20 percent range which is considered healthy and this really gets their attention in terms of the impact that sleep deprivation can have on their health and safety what I also want to point out here is well what do we do with that data you know, what, what can we turn that conversation into or what what may be a solution we recently published another systematic review and a meta-analysis where we looked at all of the studies involving shift workers where they actually monitored blood pressure uh, over a number of hours for a 24-hour period or longer. And in many cases, it was a 24-hour period during a work period and then a 24-hour period during a rest period. And this is some data from three of the studies, a pooled analysis of the dipping, that shows you that among those who were able to sleep during that 24-hour period of work, they actually were able to get into a healthy dip range uh, during that sleep period. So what this data would suggest is that if the shift worker is allowed to sleep somewhat during a, a long-duration shift, they may actually experience a healthy dip in their blood pressure. And again, that gets their attention, the EMS worker. Here's the data from our recent study of 56 night shift workers in EMS. And what I want to point out to you is that the first bar here, this is systolic pressure on the left graphic, diastolic pressure on the right graphic. What I want to point out to you here is that if the individual was able to nap at all, they were able to get into that healthy 10 to 20 percent range of a dip for systolic and also 10 to 20 percent dip for diastolic. If they didn't nap, they were blunted completely. What is also unique about this data is that we discovered that if their nap was six, less than 60 minutes, they were blunted in this population. They had to get beyond the 60 minutes in order to get to that healthier range. That's some really unique data, I think, that opens up a debate for the duration of napping specific to EMS workers. <clears throat> so I wanted to highlight that because I think for the EMS worker population, we have already established some guidelines that can help with uh, EMS employers developing fatigue risk management programs. Now we must, I think, as a, as a, um, a, a researchers, must turn our attention to um, the health aspects of shift work and what uh, negative effects are and then what are some possible interventions. Now, what I wanted to uh, allude to at the end there was that for our group, we are focusing on um, the impact of shift work on cardiovascular outcomes, in particular indicators of, of cardiovascular health, such as blood pressure and also heart rate variability. Now, before I conclude with today's presentation, I do have to mention a little bit about uh, EMS sleep and fatigue during national emergencies. We are in a very unique time in today's time with the pandemic, and some of the conversations have turned to, well, what can, what can we do to help EMS workers during times like this, during disasters and national emergencies? Well, there are really no standards out there uh, that would place major restrictions on the amount of work that an EMS worker can do during normal business hours or during uh, national emergencies. However, there is something uh, in terms of an OSHA standard that I want to mention. But before I do that, we do have plenty of reason to believe that during national emergencies like this, and many of you have probably seen many news reports of firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics who have experienced dramatic increases in stress, moral injury, PTSD, burnout, um, and a number of other uh, negative outcomes related to um, the national emergency at present. Um, but I also want to point out that not every emergency is the same. This one is obviously uniquely different from other national emergencies, such as hurricane responses and other. Um, what we have seen uh, recently is we have seen a dramatic decrease in volume for EMS over the past month and a half or so. Um, and it is really unclear how that is impacting sleep and fatigue and fatigue-related risk in the EMS workforce uh, at, at this current time. What I want to mention to you is that standards are enforceable and guidelines are not. With respect to uh, 
national standards, like I mentioned, there really are no standards for day-to-day -day activities for EMS operations. However, during national emergencies, the OSHA 29 CFR 1910-156 standard may come into play. And this standard is actually under uh, modification at the moment. It used to be referred to as the fire brigades standard. Now it is, is under develop, uh, um, modification to become the emergency responder preparedness program standard. And if it were to be adopted, you would see some mention of some limitations in work hours, such as there will be required a minimum time off during 24-hour period of 10 hours for rest or sleep, and also some consideration relative to long working hours. Um, one thing to note is that half of states recognize OSHA standards, half do not. Many of them uh, develop their own plans, which are very similar to OSHA standards, but um, not exactly. Um, and in terms of who would be in charge of enforcement of this, it really uh, is delegated down mainly to the incident commander in these sorts of situations. Um, now, I mentioned to you just a second ago that this is really under modification at the moment. There, these uh, spe specific limits on work periods are not in place now. This is really under consideration. And I want to just uh, skip over here to uh, during this process, it's going to go through uh, numerous reviews. And during that review process, if it is considered to be too burdensome, uh, there may be some um, modifications or exclusions that may be included in that potential standard. And if this does get adopted in whatever format it would get adopted, uh, many believe, and I, and I would actually, if you have questions about this, I would point you to a great resource at the National Association of State EMS Officials, uh, Kathy Robinson, who's been intimately involved in working with OSHA on this. But if this standard were to be modified and updated, as I just mentioned, it would be what is considered to be more closely in line or aligned with uh, some of the, the FEMA work or the National Incident Management System uh, that is in exist existence. Now, in summary, there are, again, very few standards that really impact EMS work hours or EMS fatigue out there. That's, that's why the EMS uh, the 2018 uh, evidence-based guidelines for fatigue risk management were, were produced because there simply were, were not any real standards out there. And it, it, again, it's not standards, it's a guideline, uh, but it is something. The guidelines that I just uh, reviewed uh, are available, freely available, and again, the target audience here was EMS employers. And much of what we know uh, from that discovery of research and that synthesis of the published research is based in large part on indirect evidence, non-EMS worker research. However, it does provide um, a, a really strong synthesis of, of, of the published evidence, and we have tailored the recommendations to fit EMS. There's a great deal of heterogeneity out there in EMS operations, and as you can imagine, the application of any recommendation uh, as outlined in those guidelines, would really vary dramatically from agency to agency. And we have seen that in terms of anecdote uh, post-publication of those, those guidelines. Um, in terms of the next steps, I, as I mentioned before, I think one of the key next steps here is that we do investigate the impact of shift work and highlight the impact of shift work on EMS worker health. We have done a great deal of, of synthesizing the evidence relative to the impact of shift work on performance and safety as a result of the guideline project. I think for those who are still on the fence in terms of some of the controversial recommendations, such as the napping, such as the shift duration, that if we can complement that work with new research that looks at the health effects of shift work and the, the health benefits of certain types of interventions, I think you can see another seed change in EMS fatigue risk management that would, I think, lead to a great increase in sleep health for this, uh, this, this unique workforce. Great. Thank you very much. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Patterson for being our featured speaker today and facilitating, facilitating an interesting round of discussion. I'd like to thank all of you for your time and participation. This webinar will be posted on our NIOSH work schedules webpage where you can sign up for future announcements on this topic. 
And with that, I hope that you will join us again for the next installment of the NIOSH Director Seminar Series on Work and Fatigue. Thank you very much. <laughs>